Good morning and welcome to City Church. We are so glad that each and every one of you are here with us today. We have uh, just an exciting day of worship and, uh, and teaching that's gonna happen today. Uh, it's just gonna be a great day uh, with, with God's people. Uh, we, we actually have a, a new song we wanna introduce to you this morning and it's called Praise. Uh, but first I want to uh, read from, from Psalms 150. Um, it, it says, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds and praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound, praise him with lute and harp, praise him with tambourine and dance, praise him with strings and pipe, praise him with sounding cymbals, praise him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And that's what this song is about this morning. So I wanna invite y'all to stand as we learn this song together. Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure, and praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm numbered, and praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the waters, my enemies drown.
how deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond our measure that He should give His only Son to make a righteous treasure. His face away as wounds which my the chosen one bring many sons to glory. On his shoulders, ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. And it was my sin that held him there until it was a call. Father, we worship you today because of who you were, who you are, who you're going to be. God, we worship you today because of your love for us. God, you sent your son to die for us. You care for us that much. We worship you today because, God, we know that there is no other like you. There is no other powerful like you. There is no other loving like you. God, we just thank you so much for being the God you are. God, I'm so thankful that we have someone to turn to in times of need, in times of struggle, no matter the circumstances that are going on in our lives. God, uh, under my breath, I, I whisper all the time prayers to you. And God, I know that those are heard. I don't do it near often enough. As someone who listens all the time, I could be talking to you all the time, but God, you do listen when I speak. 
God, I know the outcome of circumstances or situations are gonna look different from how I have it planned out, but God, I'm so thankful that you are an all-knowing God. You are all-powerful God. You make the moves where they need be. And God, we, we lay our problems at your feet. God, thank you for loving us. God, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for singing. You can have a seat. Ah, oh, well, good morning, everybody. How about we start with some really good news, some fun stuff. Y'all okay with that? We've had two babies born in the last few days, and so I want to share and introduce them to you this morning. Uh, the first one, oh, there was a kid up there just a second ago. This, this here is Rayleigh Gray Kennard. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Welcome, Rayleigh, to the world. Rayleigh is the first child, the first little girl of parents, Wade and Gabby, and baby's doing great, mama's doing great, and so uh, excited for them. Now, second baby, this is uh, uh, Scott David Morrison, uh, known as Scotty, and Scotty's the second child of Miller and Slayton Morrison, and he is the little brother to Miss Massey there. So how about we welcome little Scotty to the world? Now, always fun to share that kind of stuff. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? Some of you are familiar with that phrase. If you are in the business world, sales world, you know the phrase, what's in it for me? Or maybe you know it by the acronym WIFM, W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? It's a well-known tactic in marketing and advertising, essentially uh, what's in it for me describes what the customer or the audience will get out of buying a product or using a product. And anytime you uh, are writing an article or you're giving a speech, um, anytime you're making a, a presentation, you're trying to get someone's business, the absolute must, the secret, is that you have to answer the question for them, what's in it for me? Experts will tell you that if you want to get people to volunteer for an organization, you don't need to tell them about the needs. You need to tell them what's in it for them. Think about when you go and donate blood. They don't tell you about the needs of all the people in dire straits in the hospital. What do they say? Give a pint, get a t-shirt. Give a pint, get a gift card. What's in it for me? Now, there are some who just come right out with it. They're not bashful about it at all. Like, yo, what's in it for me? And they'll just ask you right out. And then there are others who are more subtle. They don't say it out loud. That would be a rude violation of my southern nonchalance. They don't say it Loudly, they are thinking it quietly. Well, what's in it for me, sugar? The question is inherent to human nature. Every human asks it. When we have to consider our resources, our time, our energy, our effort, we ask, what's in it for me? Does this help me in some way? And if you ask a sociologist, they'll tell you that it's part of our survival instinct. But if you ask a theologian, we get a different answer. And a theologian will tell you that, yes, survival is part of our nature, but it's part of our sinful, broken, self-centered nature, a nature that is marred and twisted, a nature that is not as God intends. And in our salvation, God doesn't just forgive our brokenness, does he? He repairs it. And God doesn't just forgive our sin, it's defeated. And so we are empowered in Christ to live differently, aren't we? See, for the Christ follower, what's in it for me is not the first question that we ask. What's in it for me is not really what we're thinking. See, Christ followers serve others when there is no benefit to ourselves because our hearts have been changed. 
Christ's followers serve others when there is no benefit to ourselves because our hearts have been changed. The thing which Jesus does in us is make us people who do not live our lives asking, what's in it for me? Instead, we as Christ followers ask, what can I do for you? So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about why Christians serve. And serving is a, a key part of what it means to be city church and what it means to be a part of city church. It's, it's who we are. Now, for the last two weeks, we've looked at two important things. We looked at our vision as a church, and we said, we made a commitment that we will pursue our vision with intentionality. Everything that we do here has intentionality behind it of engaging people far from God with the gospel. And then the second thing we said, we looked at, was our mission. And we said that we will generously support the mission of God of our church, intentionality and generosity. Now, for the next three weeks, we're going to look at the three major pathways that make up the city church way. This is what we're going to look at for the next three weeks is how we make disciples. It's, it, we encourage our people to do three things, to make three, take three steps. And if you do these things, they will help you become more and more like Christ. Now, the first of these is what we call serve. And that we will serve the needs of others in the church and in the community. We think it's so important that we have an entire ministry that's called Serve. It's right over there on the wall. The second step is that we commit our lives to groups. We live connected to one another in a community group and we grow together. It's so important to us that we have an entire ministry that's called Groups. It's right over there on the wall. Now, the third thing, we'll look at this in three weeks, is worship. Worship, that we commit ourselves to passionately worship the Lord and only the Lord. And guess what you're doing right now? Worship. It's so important that we structure our lives around it. And we believe that if you will commit to these three things, to serving and to being connected in a group and to worship regularly, uh, systematically, you will change. You will grow. If you let this be part of your life and your faith, you'll grow spiritually. You'll be involved missionally. Now, you know, a blind squirrel finds a nut every now and then. And so I want you to look at this, what your staff has done. There's three parts of, of the city church way, groups, serve, and worship. Sunday morning, we have two hours of programming. And then we have Wednesday night, a third hour of programming. Do you know what that means? That means that you have a time slot where you can participate in all three of those things. There's a time for you to worship, there's a time for you to serve, and there's a time for you to be a part of a group. Look at that. Isn't that amazing how that works out? And if you think about it for 0 .002 seconds, uh, you might even be able to see the two great commandments of God in those three things. Now, we're going to be in a passage of Scripture today that is one of the really formational, formative passages of Scripture, John chapter 13. So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and fire it up, turn it on, open it up. We'll be in John chapter 13. And while you're turning there, let me ask you a question. What would you do if it was the last day of your life? You could do anything you wanted. It's the last day of your life. What would you do? Maybe there's someone that you'd like to talk to. You say, if it's the last day of my life, you know, I would really, I'd like to tell this person how much I love them. Or I'd like to talk to this person and tell them how much I appreciate them. Maybe there would be something you'd like to confess to somebody and say, you know, before I die, I really want to get this off my chest. Um, years ago, we were at a church and we were about to renovate the, 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 the church building. And in the foyer of the church, were all of these plaques, dozens and dozens of plaques of almost anything that had ever been given to the church, any amount of money, somebody got a plaque, and they were hanging all over the foyer. Now, it was incredibly weird and awkward, in my opinion, and I asked them, I said, hey, what's the deal with all the plaques? Every time somebody gives money, they get a plaque? 
Uh, didn't Jesus say something about not announcing, you know, your giving with trumpets? And he's like, yeah, he said trumpets. He didn't say anything about a plaque. Um, and so there were plaques everywhere. Well, we go through this renovation. All the plaques were taken down. Everything was painted. And then when we go back, I said, hey, where's, where's the plaques? And they were gone. And ask all around, hey, have you seen the plaques? Haven't seen the plaques. Don't know where the plaques are. I said, well, there's going to be some, some folks mad, but we dealt with it. Three or four years later, I've announced that I'm leaving, what my, we're moving, and I had a staff member came to me one day, comes to my office, Luther, you, can, you got a minute, comes in, he closes the door, he sits down, says, I need to talk to you. And it was one of those talks where like, this isn't good. He says, I need to confess something. My heart sank. I had no idea what he's about to say. And he put his head down and he goes, I'm the one that threw the plaques away. And I said, are you serious? I asked you. He goes, I know, I had to lie. Because you needed to be able to tell people you didn't know where, what happened to them. And so, you know, the whole time you've been able to say that you honestly didn't know what happened to them. But I knew what happened to them. I'm the one that threw them away. And so that was just like, that was, he just needed to confess something, right? And so maybe it's your last day. You're like, you know, I need to get that off my chest. Or maybe it's something different. Maybe there's a meal that you would want. You'd say, I, I'd, I'd love a Wagyu steak or if my last day, I would want my grandmother's chicken pot pie. Or maybe there's a city that you would want to see, like Paris or Barcelona or Kynard, Florida. And <laughs> you're wondering, why do we have all these members from Kynard uh, that drive in here? Is there something magical about that place? You want to go and check it out. Or maybe there's some experience that you would want to have, like a hot air balloon or skydiving. Maybe there's someone you'd like to meet. Maybe you're a Swifty. And you'd like to meet Taylor before you die. Um, we, we had a lady in our, at a church one time. She played piano, and she always wanted to meet George Strait because, according to her, he just looks like he smells good. <laughs> I think the answer to that question, what would you do if it was the last day of your life, it probably reveals a lot about a person, don't you think? Probably tells us a lot about a person. When John is telling the story of Jesus, he, he kind of answers this question for us. He kind of answers it for us. In John 13, the public ministry of Jesus is over. And from here on out, everything revolves around the passion. Every event, every episode, every conversation is a funnel to the cross. So in chapter 13, verse 1, let's begin reading. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So what did John just say? It, the end is here. The end is here. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So he knows the end is here. Verse 4, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Let's pause there. I want to share with you three thoughts today about humility and the humility that that leads to serving. And the first thing is this. Humility begins with the example of Jesus. Humility begins with the example of Jesus. Life in the ancient world was rough and disgusting. You can imagine a world with dirt roads, sewer systems that were either non-existent or completely insufficient. Animals filled the streets. They filled, they filled field, uh, fields or even homes. So when you would go to someone's house, your feet would be washed as a matter of hospitality, but also as a matter of hygiene. And who would they be washed by? Who would wash your feet? It would be a slave. It would be a household slave, what we call a doulos, would wash your feet. But here, at this meal, there is no slave there, so it's Jesus that gets up and wraps the towel around him and grabs a basin, and he begins to wash the feet of a bunch of grown men which I can hardly think of anything I would want to do less than touch another grown man's foot, let alone 12 of them. And yet, I don't know how to emphasize this strongly enough. John tries to. John tries to show you the depths. 
to which Jesus stoops here when he says, he knew the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. And he got up and he grabbed a towel. You see, there's nowhere in ancient literature where a superior person washes the feet of an inferior. It doesn't exist in the ancient literature. Rabbis did not wash the feet of their students. Generals did not wash the feet of their soldiers. Masters did not wash the feet of their slaves. It was a world of clear hierarchies, hierarchy that wasn't violated. But the good news of the kingdom of Jesus is that when God is king, there are no more hierarchies among people. In the kingdom of God, all the people at the top are the people who willingly stoop down and serve those at the bottom gladly. You see, in their world, greatness was measured by how many people served you, greeted you, honored you. But in God's economy, greatness is measured by how we serve others. Now, here's a question. Why did Jesus wash their feet? Was it a political stunt? Was it for an Instagram post? You know that for Jesus, ministry is not a photo op. Why did Jesus wash their feet? Well, you might say, well, because they were dirty. And although that seems like a reasonable answer, that's not the answer. John tells us that he washed their feet because he loved them. He washed their feet because he loved them. This was sincere. There's no ulterior motive. Verse 1, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. You remember a couple of weeks ago how I, I told you how John loves double entendres. He loves words and phrases that have double meaning. And, and, and he loves words where there's double meaning and both meanings work. Where you go, I don't know what he could say. He might mean this. He might mean this. And John does this deliberately over and over. And when he says he loved them to the end, he, it might mean that he loved them right up until the end, right up until his death. That would make sense. But it also means he loved them to the utmost. He was showing them the full extent of his love, of just how much he loved them. He loved them and so he served them. Listen to this quote from Mother Teresa. Wash the plate, not because it's dirty, not because you're told to wash it, but because you love the person who will use it next. Isn't that good? Humility begins with the example of Jesus. Jesus had nothing to prove, nothing to protect, nothing to possess. He's the one who made himself nothing. He took on the form of a servant. He, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus' life was a long, descending, spiral staircase of humility. And he went low again and again and again. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Here's the best thing I'm going to tell you. Humility is not the opposite of divinity. It is the, humility is the expression of divinity. Humility is not the opposite of divinity. It's not the opposite of who God is. It's the expression of it. Christianity presents us with a God who is holy and who is all-knowing, who is omnipotent, God's everywhere, he is all-powerful, uh, he is omniscient, he knows everything. God has all the virtues and all the attributes, but what makes Christianity a scandal is that, according to our faith, God is also the most humble. And if you want to be like God, be like Jesus. When you get in the yoke with Jesus, you discover he's exactly who he says he is. He's gentle and humble in heart. He's not forceful. He's not demeaning. He's not exploitive. Jesus came so that those who live should no longer live for themselves. So we have the example of Jesus. Do we need anything more than that? I don't think we do because the heart of our discipleship is to emulate Jesus, to follow him, to live the way he lived, treat people as he did. And he gave us here the most profound example of servanthood the world has ever seen. So we can say this, we are never more like Jesus than when we are serving others. Humility begins with the example of Jesus.
Number two, humility has the power to transform the human heart. Humility has the power to transform the human heart. And that's important because God very much intends to create a people who will be a reflection of himself to the world. He intends to take a people who, if left to themselves, are nothing like God. But he intends to change them and transform them so that they are people who are like him. So God has quite the task ahead of him, doesn't he? And just looking at all of you, I'm tempted to ask, are you sure, Lord? Are you sure these are the people you want to use? Because are, are you sure you don't want to get some MVPs and some VIPs to do this? Because this bunch looks more like the Bad News Bears than the Atlanta Braves. And they talk like them, too. So at this point in the story, we have Peter who opens his mouth. And we all say, surprise, surprise, Peter has something to say. Um, and this is important because I think Peter is kind of like a metaphor for all of us in this story. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? You can hear Peter's, Peter's just... He can't believe what's happening. Jesus said, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. And Peter said, no, you shall never wash my feet. Not going to let it happen. And Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And then Peter says, well, just give me a bath then, right? Uh, uh, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body's clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that's why he said not everyone was clean. It's amazing that Jesus is aware that the wheels of evil are turning. He's aware, even as they're talking and eating and conversing, that the betrayal has happened, and it is happening, but that does not deter him from serving everyone there. Now think about Peter. He's impetuous. He's emotional, he's impulsive, Peter is headstrong, he's bossy, he's a control freak. Peter seldom thinks anyone else has a better idea than he has. When you look at Peter, Peter jumps out of boats. One time he attacks somebody with a sword. I mean, when you attack somebody with a sword, things get serious real quick. Peter's a guy that you want on your team but you're also kind of afraid of what he might do if he's on your team. That's Peter. And yet Jesus also said Peter was going to be the rock on whom he would build the church. So how are we going to get Peter the impetuous and turn him into Peter the rock? And how is God going to take a bunch of people who are a bunch of Peters and turn them into a community that looks like Jesus. How many of you say, you know, when I look at Peter, I see a lot of me in Peter? Like, a lot of us look at that and say, yeah, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a foot in the mouth kind of person. Some of us would go, Peter, I'm way worse than Peter. How is God going to take us and turn us into a, a community like Jesus? Well, Luther, I'm not like Peter. I'm humble. In fact, I think I'm much more humble than you would even understand. You think you're humble? Well, yeah, I think I'm incredibly humble. Let's take a humility test. Don't answer these out loud. Just follow along. little test here on your humility. Can you be corrected? Can you be corrected? When someone gives you feedback that you don't like, do you say thank you? How often do you consider the perspective of others? Or do you assume that you are always right? When's the last time you invited someone with whom you disagree to teach you something? That you said, you know, I never considered it from that point of view. Tell me more. I'd like to learn more. When is the last time you changed your mind about an important issue? And just went ahead and admitted that pineapple on pizza is a ridiculous idea. <laughs> when, when have you done that? Are you willing to admit when you're wrong? How many of you would rather die than admit that you were wrong? 
How many of you will argue even when you secretly know that you're wrong? You're just not going to give in. Let's go, let's go deeper. So humility can accept correction. When someone complains about something we, we do, do we listen or do we react? Do we fire back? Well, let me tell you what you always do. Let me ask you, is, is your sense of identity torn down by the words of people? Or is your sense of identity rooted in the love and good news of Jesus? Does your sense of emotional well-being fluctuate with the words that people speak about you? Does, does your identity suffer as a victim of people's flawed and prejudiced opinions about you? Are we humble enough to listen or are we protecting an idealized version of ourselves that we have created in our minds? See, we need to be strong, to have a strong enough self so that we can be humble before others. We need to be anchored in our identity and who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us so that we can gladly accept and walk in humility before others because it is really hard to serve the world. And it is really hard to do humble things and do hidden things if your emotional well-being depends on the esteem of other people. If your identity and your emotional well-being needs people to applaud you and affirm you and, and esteem you, you're going to have a hard time with humble things. How in the world will our hearts ever embrace humility? Jesus says something here that I think gives us the secret. It's in verse 7. When Peter is just a word my mom would use, flabbergasted at what Jesus is doing, Jesus says, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will. Later you'll understand. Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, serving is a, is a value that it takes time to learn and appreciate. Later, you're going to understand the value of serving others is a lesson that takes time to learn and appreciate. You don't learn that on the first day. You don't learn that on the first try. Peter's going to look back and say, wait a minute, you mean the, the king of kings humbled himself and washed my feet? You mean... He died for a world that was not worthy of him. Serving, serving takes time to learn and to appreciate. You say, take out the trash. And they say, well, it's not mine. I didn't say it was yours. I said, take it out. Later, you will understand why you need to do things that's not your fault, not your responsibility. And so all the way to the trash can, we're complaining, aren't we? This wasn't even my trash. Why am I having to do this? This is so dumb. Can't believe they're making me do this. See, cultivating a life of humility is a real struggle because some of you were raised exactly the opposite. This is the part of the sermon nobody amens. I'll just warn you. Your heart needs selfless, unnoticed, unapplauded serving of others. Your hands need to get dirty. Your best shirt needs to get stained. How else will you ever move closer to humility in our culture? We need to serve because humility is one of those qualities that you cannot acquire through willpower. You can't coerce yourself to be humble. Humility only comes through surrender and through servanthood by doing things like grabbing basins and washing feet. Nothing transforms your heart more than doing a task that no one wants to do. Doing a task that goes unnoticed by everybody else, and you have to fight through all of the emotions and all the toxicity because no one appreciates me, no one has said thank you to me, you have to walk, walk, work through all of that and get to a point where you are serving in humility out of love. Now, that's a massive journey, but that's a journey of transformation, of going from resentment of having to give of yourself 
to making that transformation of serving in humility out of love. Years ago, we had a, a, a gentleman at our church, and he was really well-respected in the community. He was a beloved leader in the community. If you were to ask people, name the five most respected people in our community, he would have been on everyone's list. And I watched him for years. He would arrive at our church a little after 5 a.m. in the morning on Sundays. And the first thing he would do is walk through the parking lots and pick up trash. We had spotless parking lots because of him. The second thing he would do after he picked up trash, he would go to the kitchen and he would start to make pots of coffee. Now, we never talked about that. We never had a conversation about it. But I think I know why he did it. Folks were always putting him in charge of things. Folks were always asking him to be the leader. And I think he knew that he needed to serve anonymously. He knew he needed to serve without applause just pour out love for others because humility has the power to transform the human heart. Number three, humility is what marks the church as the community of Jesus. Humility is what marks the church as the community of Jesus. Do you see what's happening here? Jesus is the example. He's the example of humility. Humility transforms the heart, and what humility is what marks the church as the community of Jesus. Let's see what Jesus has to say right after he washed their feet. Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So this was the responsibility of a slave to wash the feet. Why didn't it occur to anyone else in the room to, that everyone's feet were dirty? None of the 12 thought, maybe I should do this. Why didn't it occur to them? Here's what I think. I think that maybe they're thinking that their days of serving and stooping are coming to an end. That in their minds, Jesus is about to enter his kingdom. He said the hour of glory is here. We're about to be in charge. And when you're in charge, you don't have to do menial tasks like wash dishes or wash feet. Safe to say, no one thought it was their responsibility to wash anybody's feet. That's why nobody did it. No one thought it was their responsibility. Here's the second best thing I'm going to tell you today. Servants willingly accept responsibility that isn't theirs. I think that is the heart of the servant. Are you willing to accept responsibility that isn't yours? They gladly step in when someone else steps out. Now, the world says, clean your own feet. Your dirt is not my responsibility. But Christ's followers say, let me get some water. Let me get a basin. See, are you beginning to feel how countercultural the teachings of Jesus are? You begin to see how if you're going to follow Jesus, Jesus calls it the narrow way. A lot of people don't want to live this way. Last week, we had a team that went to Perry, Florida, cleaning up after the hurricane. Guess what? The houses that they cleaned up were not their own. The yards and the trees that they cleaned up were not their own. They went there and they stepped into someone else's need. If we're ever going to be the community of Jesus, we have to be people who willingly accept responsibility that isn't ours. Now, let me tell you, you're, you are needed here. Your gifts are needed here. Your abilities are needed here. Your love and, and your contribution is needed. But it cannot always be where you want to serve. 
It cannot always be where you want to serve. Most of the time, it has to be where you are needed to serve. Can you do the dishes? Well, I don't like dishes. Well, I didn't ask you if you like the dishes. No one likes to do the dishes. I'm asking you, are you willing to do the dishes? Let me share with you two needs in our church. Now, there's a lot of needs that we have. When you think about the serve ministry, places where you can contribute, let me give you two of them. One is among our young people, our children and our students. Men, we need more leaders and mentors with our young people. If you go down to the children's ministry, a whole lot of ladies down there. You look at the student ministry, a whole lot of ladies there. We need more men to mentor and to teach and be leaders in those, in those two ministries. I'll give you another ministry, the parking team. Now, yes, you put your life in danger out there on the highway, okay? It's a thankless job. It's hot. It's Florida. But somebody's got to help people cross the, the road safely, right? Somebody's got to care. Let me give you a little history lesson. We did this backwards. You're supposed to have the lesson and then the test. Um, we did the test earlier. Now we're getting the lesson. This is a lesson that I think the church needs right now. When you look at the very early church, that church was not just growing, it was multiplying. And all they had was the message of grace and love from their hearts and lives. They couldn't threaten anyone. They had no leverage. All they could do is invite and love. And that's the way it was for 300 years. And they flourished. But then in A.D. 313, something happened. The emperor became a Christian. And not only did Christianity become legal, it became institutionalized. The church got the power. They got the power. And when the church was in control and the church had the power, they could make the rules. And the church became defined not by the Spirit of God, not by the love of his people, but by their ability to make the rest of society do what they decided they needed to do. When the church got the power, it no longer needed to serve the community. It no longer needed to care. And there is a danger today in Christianity. I, I feel like I see it clear as day. Maybe you do too. There's a danger in Christianity where we think we are losing the power and we want to get it back. And we are willing to compromise our integrity for political power. And we are willing to compromise the way of Jesus in order to win elections. And that is not our calling. When the church is what God intends, there is nothing else like it in the world. Regular, everyday Ordinary people serving and loving one person at a time. God planted this church here in this community to do just that. And the goal is incarnational ministry, stepping into the world of others. Because all talk and no love never changed anyone. Now, the first, the first step toward community is found in humility. We live as city church in close proximity to each other. We spend a lot of time together, not only on Sundays, Wednesdays, special events. Our kids play together. Sometimes they date each other. Sometimes they marry each other. If you share space like we do, there are endless opportunities for misunderstanding, endless opportunities for hurt feelings, Differences of opinion, friction. So how in the world do we make it? You see, it is humility that makes unity possible. The fractures of our relationships are healed through humility. The wounds of the past are healed through humility. The struggle of relationships, the first step toward forgiveness are found in humility. Now, I shared this with you years ago, and I want to share it with you one more time. If we're going to be what God has called us to be, every Sunday when you show up, you've got to put on one of two things. You can put on a bib, or you can put on an apron. That's the only two options that we have. 
You can put on a bib, and that means that you, you cannot make a contribution. Like, you are so helpless, all that happens is, you know what, we're just going to take care of you, and we're going to rock you to sleep, and we're going to feed you and take care of the consequences, and that is life. But everybody who's outgrown the bib can put on an apron, and they can serve. They can serve in some capacity. They can make some contribution. And I, I include our children. I, I think our children need to, be, need to be active in learning to serve. They need to feel what it's like to get up and do for others, and it inconvenience them. And our students need to be serving in, in our church and in our community and growing that every single one of us. No one has to do everything, but everyone should do something. How many of you love a Wendy's Frosty? Raise your hand if you love a Wendy's Frosty. How many of you put your, dip your French fries in the Frosty, right? It's a little secret. Dave Thomas, thank the Lord for Dave Thomas. He was the founder of Wendy's. Many of you remember his, his picture on the commercials. People often ask Dave what made him so successful. And he would, his answer was always, he loved this question. He would say, it's my MBA my MBA, and they go, oh, your master's of business administration. He would say, nope, my mop and bucket attitude. My MBA, my mop and bucket attitude. That nothing was too insignificant. He jumped in and got the job done. Humility is a decision that we make over and over again. It's a choice you make again and again. Jesus made it in his life again and again. He went low, he went low, he went low. And it's a decision that will cost you. Sometimes it will feel like death. Sometimes it will feel like you're being crucified. But later you'll understand. Later you'll understand why it was valuable and why you needed it. And in doing so, you'll find that this is really life. This is a different kind of life. This is a new way of being. That's why Jesus says, you will be blessed if you live this way. It's the last thing he told them. You'll be blessed if you live this way. How many of you have learned that you can't outgive God? Many of you have told me, you've said, it seems like the more you do for others, the more God blesses you. The more you pour out to others, the more God seems to pour out to you. Ira Gillette was a missionary in East Africa. And he shared the story that when he was there, he noticed something that groups of people were doing repeatedly. He noticed how groups of, 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 of the locals would walk past the government hospitals for medical tr treatment, and they would come to the missionary compound to get their medical treatment there. And he saw this again and again, and he finally asked a group, why do you walk the extra distance? The government hospitals have the same treatments and the same medicines. And they said, the medicines may be the same, but the hands are different. They would go where there was love. That's the virtue of love incarnated. That's the kind of Love that makes a difference. Christ has no hands but our hands and no feet but our feet. We represent him to the world. And when we love as he loved and we serve as he served, it will make all the difference. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. So, Father, we, we hear this message. We read these words. We, we put ourselves into this story and we find that, Lord, we are pulled and we are pushed in uncomfortable ways. But, Lord, I pray that also something else might be happening. I pray that something might be igniting deep within us, a longing to live differently, a longing to have our life turned upside down and inside out, that the flow of our life might be reversed Lord, we might become people who not enjoy the experience of being served, but that we might become people who do the serving. Lord, we ask that you would just work in us what only you can work and do in us what only you can do. That, Father, through that daily choice of humbly serving others, we might become the people that you called us to be. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said...